Buenos días a todos. Bienvenidos a esta presentación sobre tendencias globales, desafíos y oportunidades para la agricultura y la alimentación. Les indicaremos unos puntos de etiqueta para los que tengan en cuenta durante esta sesión. Tendremos interpretación simultánea sobre que podrán encontrar sobre la barra inferior en la pantalla en el icono del mundo. Pueden elegir su idioma, inglés o español. Por favor, los micrófonos tienen que estar en silencio. Contamos con un chat de preguntas. Algunas de ellas serán respondidas al final de esta presentación. Sin más, cedo la palabra a los representantes del Comité Ejecutivo de Fontagro para brindar un saludo inaugural. El doctor Pedro Bustos, director nacional de línea de Chile y actual presidente de Fontagro. El doctor Arnulfo Gutiérrez, director general de DIAP de Panamá y actual vicepresidente de Fontagro. La doctora Eugenia Saiki, secretaria ejecutiva de Fontagro. Doctor Pedro Bustos, tiene la palabra. Muy buenos días a todas y todos. En nombre del Consejo Directivo de Fontagro, les damos la más cordial bienvenida a este trabajo y conferencia en línea sobre tendencias globales, desafíos, oportunidades de la agricultura y de los sistemas alimentarios con visión 2050. Agradecemos muy sinceramente la, la participación del doctor Pro Pingali, autor de este libro tan interesante, y por supuesto también del doctor Miguel Gómez, que va a ser de moderador. Sin duda, esta visión enriquecerá la planificación estratégica de Fontano. Y también agradecemos sinceramente a la Universidad de Cornell por la ayuda que nos han prestado, al BID por su plataforma tecnológica que ha puesto en servicio esta oportunidad y por supuesto también a toda la gente de la Secretaría Técnica de Fontagro que ha hecho posible que hagamos esta reunión. Así que muchas gracias, eh, bienvenido y ojalá eh, sea todo un éxito esta jornada. Muchas gracias. Muy buenos días desde Panamá. Eh, nos es muy grato eh, poder facilitar esta conferencia y especialmente con la participación del doctor Pingali, autor del libro que ya lo mencionó Pedro, y que luego de su lectura nos da cuenta del gran trabajo realizado en recopilación y análisis de tendencias y de identificación de los desafíos que nos toca en el sector. Bienvenidos. Mucho. Muy buenos días también, eh, siguiendo a Pedro y a Arnulfo y también como miembro del Comité Ejecutivo Fontagro, agradecemos a Prabhu Pingali, a Miguel Gómez, la gran amabilidad de acompañarnos en estos próximos 35 minutos de intercambio eh, respecto a las tendencias, los desafíos y las oportunidades que tiene nuestro sector agroalimentario a nivel global y también en América Latina. Así que bueno, sin más, eh, le dejo la palabra a, a Miguel eh, y a Prabhu. Eh, bienvenidos y bueno, muchas gracias por este acompañamiento. Muchas gracias Eugenia, Arnulfo y Pedro por sus palabras. Buenos días a todos y todas desde Ítaca, New York. Aquí eh, uniéndonos a la conferencia remotamente. Yo soy Miguel Gómez, soy profesor de la Universidad de Cornell. Y es un placer presentar a mi colega, el doctor Prabhu Pingali, quien nos va a hacer la presentación hoy. Yo voy a actuar como moderador. El doctor Pingali es profesor en la Escuela de Economía Aplicada en Cornell y además es director del Instituto Tata para la Agricultura y Nutrición. Antes de venir a la Universidad de Cornell, el doctor Pingali fue director adjunto de la División de Desarrollo Agropecuario de la Fundación Bill y Melinda Gates desde el 2008 al 2013. Antes de ello fue director de la División de Agricultura y Desarrollo Económico de la FAO eh, del año 2002 al 2007. Y además del 1987 al 2002 trabajó con el Grupo Internacional Consultivo para la Investigación Agrícola. 
es además miembro de la Academia de Ciencias de los Estados Unidos, una, una, un logro muy prestigioso, y es fellow de la Asociación de Economía Aplicada y, y de Agricultura Americana. Sin más, voy a darle la palabra al doctor Pingali, agradeciéndole que nos haya dedicado este tiempo. Entonces, adelante, Prabhu, eh, te dejo el micrófono. Thank you, Miguel. Um, thank you also to Eugenia, to Pedro, to Arnolfo. Thank you all for inviting me to make this presentation to your workshop. Greetings to you from Ithaca also, where I am in the same place with my friend and colleague, Miguel Gomez. Let me share my screen before I start. I'm delighted that we can make a contribution to the strategic planning of Fontagro with the, the book that we put together a couple of years ago on agriculture and food systems to 2050. This is an exercise that Rashid Siraj of FAO and myself uh, moderated over a two year process. During this time, we brought together global experts in food, agriculture, environment, and health, and had them reflect on the state of food and agriculture systems in the world, and think about where, is, where are they going in the future? What's going to be the state of food systems as we look at 2050? So the result of this exercise was the book that you see in front of you. It's an open access book. You can download all 650 pages of the book, or you can download specific chapters of the book as you see interesting. The book itself is divided into broad sections. We first talk about what are some of the big global trends in food and agriculture? And where are they going as you look towards 2050? And then we talk about the big threats and challenges that we're facing. Challenges that many of us are very aware of. Migration, urbanization that's happening. Climate change and the impact of climate change on agriculture. And of course, environmental consequences and what's happening to diets and diet-related diseases, which has become a major issue of concern. And then we spend a lot of time looking at new technologies, new innovations, new ways in which you can create disruptive futures, way in which you can break the current system, the current way of working, and create new modalities, new models, and new approaches through innovations and through technological change. We then talk about the, the global sustainability challenges, the sustainability challenges, and how do you meet the needs of a population of 9 billion and more in a way that meets their food requirements and the diversity of food requirements and improved health requirements, while at the same time trying to sustain the natural resource base and, and yes, try to improve the natural resource base. And the final part of the book brings together the policy environment that's necessary to make these changes. Without the right policy environment, we won't be able to see these changes happening. And so we bring together the policy environments that need it in order to make this change. So let me go through and give you a brief synopsis of the book itself. I think what the book does is it talks about a perfect storm of global threats and challenges. And we show that this, these global threats and challenges are happening at the same time, all together. So we see that 
urbanization is happening very rapidly. Today we are in, in a world where half the global population is living in urban areas. By 2050, we should be looking at 75% of population living in urban areas. Of course, Latin America is much more urbanized relative to Asia and Africa today. And the extent of Latin, urbanization in Latin America will be much greater than we're seeing in other parts of the world. But Asia is catching up. East Asia, Southeast Asia are catching up in terms of urbanization. And feeding the urban population that's growing, but that's also becoming richer, is going to be one of the fundamental food security challenges as we look forward. Second is diets. We see tremendous changes in diets taking place. As populations get richer, diets are becoming more diversified and people are demanding a much higher quality of diet. But at the same time, we are seeing that there's much greater demand for processed foods for a variety of reasons, including time pressure of women. And with the rise in consumption of processed foods, we begin to see a, an epidemic of non-communicable diseases that are rising. So we're facing the dual burden of malnutrition due to undernutrition and malnutrition due to overnutrition and the rise in obesity levels and non-communicable diseases. I don't have to tell you about climate change and the climate shocks that we're facing. And that's going to be a major challenge and something I'll talk about as we go through this lecture today. And finally, a last part of the, the storm that we don't really think about in a negative sense, and it shouldn't be thought about in a negative sense, is globalization and trade integration. We are seeing an increasingly connected global world, an increasingly integrated food system, with trade being a major player in integration of food systems globally. Now, what does that mean for smallholder agriculture in developing countries? Are smallholders going to benefit from this global integration of food, food systems and food markets, or are smallholders going to lose out? That's an issue that we look in great detail and I'll come back and talk to you about that. First, let's talk about what's happening with urbanization. As I mentioned, feeding urban populations that are growing in size, that are becoming richer, is going to be a major challenge for food and agriculture systems looking ahead. But it's also an enormous opportunity for growth of the agriculture sector. As the agriculture sector moves away from its preoccupation today of just staple grain production, to a more diversified food system, towards a higher quality food system, a food system, an agriculture system that's much more commercial and more integrated into markets, creates growth opportunities for farmers, farmers today and certainly farmers into the future. And I think linking rural areas to urban demand and urban growth is the way in which one can ensure long-term prosperity of farmers and rural populations. And the group that's going to be most benefited from this change, I believe, is small farms. Small farm agriculture systems that are traditionally thought of as subsistence, poor households, peasant farmers, can move towards a much more commercialized, business-oriented agriculture system and move away from agriculture as a way of life to agriculture as a business. Why do I focus on small farmers? Well, look at the data. The data is right in front of you. You see that in South Asia, where I'm from, 
close to 80% of farmers have less than two hectares of land. In much of Latin America and Caribbean, that proportion is much smaller, but it's very significant. It's still close to 50% of farmers with less than two hectares of land. And certainly some parts of Latin America, that proportion is much greater. I suspect it's much greater in Central America, it's much greater in the Caribbean, it's much greater in the Andean zone, et cetera. Now, I think this is where the challenge of commercialization is going to come from. How do we convert these two hectare farm households to become businesses? to become integrated into markets, to become more commercially oriented and to respond to market signals. That's the challenge. And it can be done. Why do I say it can be done? Well, look at what happened in Japan, what happened in Korea, what happened in Taiwan, what's happening in China now. In all of these countries, agriculture is performed on land holdings less than two hectares, some cases less than one hectare. But these are very, very commercially oriented farms. So that transformation is possible and that transformation is the future, but it requires us to create an environment where that transformation can happen. One of the reasons why that transformation is is going to be difficult and challenging is because of increased globalization and integration of food systems. What we're beginning to see today is that because of increasing trade integration that's happening, and because large parts of populations are based on the coast, in cities and the coast, it becomes cheaper to import food into these cities rather than bring it from the hinterlands within their own country. And as that happens, the competitiveness of agriculture, domestic agriculture, especially small farm agriculture, begins to decline. So here is a graph for Sub-Saharan Africa that shows you that Sub-Saharan Africa went from a net exporter of agriculture as recently as 2000 to a net importer of agriculture products and food products today. And there's been a dramatic decline in terms of trade for agriculture in Sub-Saharan Africa. And that's happened as globalization has happened, as trade integration has happened. And I suspect I can show you a similar graph for Central America. I suspect I can show you a similar graph for the Caribbean zone also. And that, that change is happening. How do we reverse this trend? I think the way one reverses this trend is massive investments in productivity improvements for smallholder agriculture. Massive improvements in productivity improvements for crops that have high demand in urban areas, fruits, vegetables, livestock products, et cetera. At the same time, massive investments in infrastructure investments, massive investments in market-related market infrastructure, communications, transport infrastructure, et cetera. If all these are brought together, then you find smallholder agriculture can become increasingly competitive relative to food that's brought in from outside through trade. That's a challenge. And I think that's a challenge we need to be addressing very clearly. The next challenge that I alluded to earlier is what's happening to diets. Diets are changing rapidly. And we see this, we see this in our own families and within our own communities. But the changes in diets have been good and bad. It's been good in terms of the diversity of food that we're consuming but we're also consuming a lot of processed food. We're consuming a lot of high energy dense food, a lot of sugary beverages, sugary food, high calorie food, etc. Now what that's leading to 
is changes in health, higher risks of diet-related diseases that are happening. Um, high blood pressure, cholesterol problems, diabetes coming in, cardiovascular problems, etc. And today, diet-related diseases are becoming more important than the traditional chronic diseases that we think about. So we see that over the decades, we've made significant progress in addressing traditional chronic communicable diseases. We've made tremendous progress in hunger reduction, poverty reduction, but malnutrition continues to rise. And it's not the undernutrition side of malnutrition that's rising, it's the overnutrition side of malnutrition and the rise in non-communicable diseases and the rise in obesity. That's the public health challenge that we are facing today. It's the food and health challenge and the interlinkages between the two that we need to address. I've, I show you here some examples of countries and their obesity incidents. If you look at Malaysia, over 44% of the population is overweight or obese. Over a third of the population in Thailand is overweight or obese. Now, I, I suspect the situation is very similar in parts of Latin America. I suspect the situation is similar in countries like Mexico, Brazil, some of the Caribbean islands, et cetera. And this challenge, the public health challenge on, of obesity growth is something that we all need to take seriously. And food plays a big role in this. Food plays a big role in helping us think through better diets, more nutritious diets. If we can create mechanisms for the food system to provide more nutritious food in a more affordable way to the poor, then you create an alternative to processed food. And then you create an opportunity for reducing this gap the trade-off that we see with growth taking place and the rise in processed food consumption that's happening. Climate change. It's an area that's become so well known that we don't need to talk a lot about climate change. We know about the effects of high temperatures. We know about the effects of extreme events. But I think it's important to realize that we know about these issues more for temperate zone countries, for higher latitudes, and we know less about the impact of climate for tropical countries, for countries in lower latitudes. Also, we know a lot about impacts of climate change on crops that are very popular in the North, rice, wheat, maize, etc. But we know less about the impact of climate change on roots and tubers, crops such as cassava, millets, sorghum. We know very little about the impact of climate change on vegetables, on livestock products, etc. And I think that's the challenge. What we need to do as we look forward is to create much more evidence around the impact of climate change on tropical agriculture systems and crops that are important to the poor. That's where our effort needs to go in. And that's, that's where we need to build climate resilience as we look forward. We also know quite a bit about what's happening to our environment. We know that we are degrading our natural resource base, our soil base, soil fertility is declining rapidly, erosion issues are a major problem. We're running out of fresh water systems, etc. cetera. I mean, there's a lot of change that's happening and we are really pushing against the planetary boundaries. And as we look forward, if business as usual continues, we'll see ourselves breaking those boundaries and seeing massive degradation. But the good news is we don't have to be there. The good news is we already have significant amount of knowledge 
and new technologies and innovations that can help us create a more sustainable food systems, even as we meet the rising demand for food and rising demand for diversity of food. And that's something that we emphasize a lot in the book. And I'll talk about some of those issues as we go along. So I think as we look forward, the good news for us is there's a lot of new technological innovations happening. And technological innovations that are creating disruptions in the way we do business and creating new futures for us. And I think that's the challenge we have as a food and agriculture community is that many of these innovations are happening outside the food system, outside the food and agriculture system per se. And we need to identify these innovations and bring them into the food system. For example, the entire issue of smart farming happens because of the innovations that took place in smartphone technology, information uh, ICT technologies, um, satellite imagery, et cetera. But bringing them all together into a way in which you can help farming become more smarter and more sustainable has been the innovation that the food and agriculture system had to make. There's a long way still to go, but at least we are moving in that direction. Think about 3D printing, 3D printing, and then 4D printing, 4D printing, adds the time dimension. So even after you print something, it changes over time. So when you think about these technologies, they were not brought up with the idea of food in mind, but then bringing them into the food sector then creates new opportunities for creating food, more nutritious processed foods, plant-based food that I'll be talking about, et cetera. So there are, all kinds of new opportunities for technological innovations that not only help us meet the demands of the future, but to do it in a more sustainable way, to do it in a smarter way. I'll give you a few examples. And, and most of my examples are about leapfrogging. Leapfrogging is something we talk about quite a bit in the book. It's it's using technology and knowledge to be able to jump over traditional developmental hurdles that we face. For example, even 10 years ago, we did not think cell phones would be as ubiquitous as they are now in rural areas. You can go into any rural community anywhere in the world today and you will see cell phones everywhere. Cell phones have basically made landlines, land-based telephones obsolete. That's an example of leapfrogging. Now, smartphones have come in. Smartphones have brought in information to the hands of farmers. Farmers know today what the weather situation is like, what the prices are like, what the market structure is like. Uh, what, how to look at some of the diseases in their fields, etc., using smartphones. It's still a long way to go before farmers can use them the same way they're using cell phones, but the technology is starting to grow in developing countries. And what smartphones will do is make traditional extension systems obsolete. And that's something we should be prepared for. Another example, solar powered, uh, decentralized, small scale solar power systems that generate electricity, that generate power for pumping water, et cetera, are coming up quite dramatically across the developing world. And farmers are able to, to access power being off the grid. That's a big change. And that allows you to leapfrog the traditional constraint of electricity infrastructure that has to be provided to vast areas. So solar energy can come in as a major leapfrogging technology. Another example of leapfrogging, 
biotechnology, genetic engineering, gene editing technologies that are coming in. Today, we have the capacity to use gene editing to enhance the positive qualities of certain crops, improve nutrition, quality, etc., and reduce the negative qualities such as um, uh, improved resistance to certain diseases, improved resistance to drought, to salinity, etc. These technologies are there and they, were, they can allow us to leapfrog the traditional long time lag of a breeding process which can take 20, 30 years for a new variety to be released. The constraints are not so much on the technology side today. The constraints are more on the regulatory systems, consumer acceptance of the technology, et cetera. And that's an area that one needs to look at more carefully to say, how do we create mechanisms for being able to benefit from some of these new technologies that are coming in? Plant-based meat is an, another area that we're beginning to see a lot of. Interestingly, during this pandemic period, we've seen a lot more demand for plant-based meat, especially in the US. Uh, there could be many reasons for that, and I'm not sure I know enough about that. But plant-based meat is, is growing as a food product quite rapidly. It's still a niche product. It's still a small share of the total meat industry. It's less than 2% of the total meat industry. However, the opportunity for growth is there. The opportunity for growth of plant-based meats and then in the future, looking at cell-based, lab-grown meats is an opportunity that's coming in and that can help us leapfrog some of the traditional problems, environmental problems that we have in the livestock sector. But I'm not yet convinced that, we, that the nutritional value is equal. I'm not yet convinced that plant-based meat can be a perfect substitute for animal-based products from a nutritional point of view. But the environmental benefits are quite significant and it's worth looking at. I'm actually working on a review piece right now on the overall progress and market potential for plant-based meat products. And, and that's going in much more detail on this subject. We talked a little bit about ICT and smartphones and precision agriculture. I think bringing in a marriage between satellite, satellite imagery, uh, big data technologies and big, big data processing systems, information technologies, smartphones, all together to make farming smarter has been one of the big innovations that's happened in the food and agriculture system over the last decade and a half. Much of these technologies are being used in in Western countries, on larger farms, more commercial farms. You don't see them used in small farm agriculture systems. One of the reasons for it is you don't have the scale. Small farms don't have the scale to be able to use these technologies. So the challenge we have is, how do you bring this technology to smallholder agriculture? There are ways to think about it. There is to think about aggregation across smallholders, farmer producer organizations that work together using these technologies, et cetera. And those are, that's where I think we need to be thinking about in the future. How do you take this enormously important technology that has high sustainability benefits and bring it to smallholder agriculture in developing countries? That's something we need to be thinking about as we look ahead. Ecological intensification is the other way to think about long-term sustainability of our resource base, even as we enhance productivity. Today, you've got the ecologists working separately from agriculture scientists. 
the two disciplines don't have a common bridge, a common language, a common way of working together. But there's enormous potential for ecological principles to be brought into agriculture production systems and farm management systems in a way that one can enhance the long-term sustainability of agriculture through better management of the farm ecology and the overall watershed ecology. We, we don't have good examples of these groups coming together. But as we look to the future, if these two groups don't come together, we are not going to be able to address the sustainability issues as much as we ought. Now, uh, I've talked a lot about science and technology. A lot of the science and technology uh, investments that are happening are happening through a variety of sources today. In historically, when you talked about agriculture technology, you, you talked about technologies coming out of agriculture universities like Cornell or out of public sector research institutions like USDA in the US, Embrapa in Brazil or ICAR in India. But much of the innovation in agriculture and food systems today is coming from private sector companies, large agribusiness companies. The scale at which they're operating is much, much greater than public sector companies. And the innovations are enormous. The challenge, of course, for us is how do you get those innovations to meet the needs of small farm agriculture in developing countries? What's the role of policy in making that happen? So that's the challenge. The other issue I want to bring up here is a large part of the new innovations that are outside of agriculture that can have contributions to agriculture coming from non-traditional players. For example, NASA has invested a lot in ready to eat food products for astronauts, for people who may one day fly to Mars. It's uh, making the food safe, make, keeping the quality, uh, shelf life of food, et cetera. Now those innovations can have huge impacts on our food systems as that filters in. So we need to look at that. You have companies such as, uh, you have universities such as MIT that are working on big data systems, working on drones and satellite imagery. Much of that information then flows into our food and agriculture research. So there's a whole new set of players coming in and we need to be able to look beyond our traditional sources of information and technology as we look ahead and as we look towards building up that future. My last point here is on policy. Today, when you think about policies, every ministry has their own policies, right? So agriculture ministry has their policies. The food and consumer ministry has their own policy. Nutrition has their own policy. Environmental has their own policy. The challenge, of course, is when you think about the food value chain, all of these ministries have to be converging towards one common set of policies. One common set of policies that look at the multidimensional impacts of agriculture from the environmental side all the way to human health. And bringing that multidimensional, multi-sectoral convergence in agriculture and food policy is an enormous challenge that we face as we look ahead. And remember, we don't have good models on that. Even the Western world, the more advanced countries don't have this convergence across these multi-sectoral policies. So we're all learning together. But I think the Latin American region may be able to be a pioneer in this and bring about that convergence across these ministries. So with that, let me stop here.
and I'm happy to be part of the discussion. I also want to remind you that our book is open access, is available. You, here's the link to download it. And let me stop by saying the challenges are huge, but I, I'm very optimistic that we have new opportunities, new innovations, new technologies that can help us get to a world where we can meet the demand and to do it sustainably. Thank you. Thanks, Miguel. Back to you. Muchas gracias, eh, Dr. Pingali, por la excelente presentación. Muy brevemente, eh, quiero mencionar que este libro ha sido inspirador eh, a través de este trabajo del plan de mediano plazo de Fontagro. Y lo que yo quiero resaltar es que el, el, los principios y la discusión resaltan la importancia de entender el problema de la investigación agrícola y en alimentos integrada con, otros, con otras áreas, como lo mencionó el doctor Pingali, como es el área de la tecnología, el área de la nutrición, el área, de la, el área, el área social, el área ambiental. Eh, y nos habla también de la importancia de, de, de entender cuál es, esa, esa, es el rol del sector público en investigación y del sector privado y cómo coordinar de la mejor manera para que, para que haya sinergias que resulten en mayor impacto. Con esto voy a eh, darle la palabra a Pedro para que haga sus comentarios y si tenemos tiempo para hacer un par de preguntas al final. Muchas gracias, Pedro. Eh, muchas gracias, eh, doc doctor Pingali. Eh, realmente ha sido una charla muy, muy interesante para todos los que hemos participado. Eh, sin duda, los desafíos de la agricultura y de la alimentación son muchos y muy complejos, y son a nivel mundial y, por supuesto, a nivel de nuestros países de Latinoamérica y el Caribe. Como podemos extraer de la charla, estos son múltiples, ¿no es cierto? Tenemos problemas ambientales, la gestión de los recursos naturales, el cambio climático, el tema de las tecnologías, ¿ah? todo lo que tiene que ver con el mejoramiento genético, las prácticas sostenibles, las tecnologías digitales, la conectividad, la bioeconomía y la gestión de las pérdidas, de los desechos, tan importante cuánta, cuánto alimento se pierde en, en este minuto. Todo lo que tiene que ver con aspectos sociales, que tiene que ver con la migración, la urbanización de, lo, de, de las ciudades, eh, y la ida de nuestra juventud a las ciudades y que no se quedan en, 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 en el campo, en la zona rural. La salud y la nutrición, la economía y los mercados. Eh, y podemos seguir enumerando muchos eh, desafíos. Pensamos que la manera de abordarlos es con un trabajo de colaboración y cooperación, fomentando estas plataformas eh, multiactores, público, privada, industria, pequeños agricultores, que ha sido uno de los pilares del quehacer de Fontagro estos últimos 22 años desde su fundación. Quisiera terminar eh, con un, una frase con la cual empezó su charla el doctor Pingali, y que dice que estamos en la tormenta perfecta, la tormenta perfecta. Tenemos muchas amenazas y desafíos que se entrelazan, pero a mí me gustaría pensar que vamos a ser capaces de llegar a un buen puerto a pesar de la tormenta. Eh, quisiera agradecer nuevamente al doctor Pingali, a todos los participantes de esta charla que se han conectado desde muchas partes y por supuesto a toda la plataforma que nos ha ayudado este día. Muchas gracias a todos. Gracias, Pedro. Vamos a tener tiempo para un par de preguntas. La primera es de Rubén Echavarría. Eh, gracias, eh, Prado, por la presentación. Mencionas que necesitamos inversiones masivas en muchos frentes y que no han pasado en Latinoamérica en años recientes. ¿De dónde van a venir estos fondos frente a la, a, a la situación económica eh, de post-COVID? Y... 
¿Puede Latinoamérica y el Caribe in invertir more efe efectivamente, más eh, eficientemente? Eh, ¿A qué tipo de nivel, a nivel regional o internacional, en, en inversiones de, en, en bienes públicos? Eh, por favor, eh, si nos puedes dar tus opiniones sobre estas, estas, esta pregunta. You want me to respond, Miguel? Sí, por favor. Um, thank you, Ruben. Ruben is a good friend from a long time. And I'm, I suspect Ruben knows the answer to the question better than I do. Um, I think there's one of the ways in which the funds can be generated is we need a better understanding of the importance of investments in agriculture, which many countries unfortunately think we've solved the agriculture problem and we don't have anything new to do in the food and agriculture sector. And I think presenting the case of, of these challenges, this perfect storm and how one needs to address this perfect storm at the country level and the regional level is really important. And I think that's one way to get uh, the attention back on agriculture. But the other way to think about it is to think about the synergies between agriculture and the other global problems. So think about the synergies between agriculture and climate change, the synergies between agriculture and planetary boundaries, etc. And that then allows us as agriculture and food people to be able to access some of the funding that goes to climate change work or environmental sustainability work, et cetera. I think that's another way to think about it. And, and I'm sure lots of people are trying to figure this out. Convergence across ministry has the positive benefit that then one can look at funds across ministries rather than ministry specific funds. And that's another important way to think about it. And finally, private sector investments in agriculture um, need to be encouraged a lot more. I'm not just talking about multinational sector investments. I'm talking about local investments, small industries, small scale um, institutions, research systems, etc. can also provide very useful uh, innovations coming forward. And they should, the regulatory systems for promoting um, such investments need to be uh, improved and, and enhanced. Let me stop there. Gracias. Tenemos una segunda pregunta. Tenemos muchas preguntas, pero nos tenemos que limitar a dos dado el tiempo. Un reciente, un reporte reciente de la FAO habla de que la producción de, de alimentos nutritivos es más costoso en Latinoamérica y el Caribe que en otras áreas. ¿Cómo puede la región bajar los costos de los productos nutritivos para que sean, para que, para que, para que la gente los pueda comprar? Thank you. Um, I haven't seen that FAO report, so I'm not quite sure exactly what the premise of that report is. Um, but my perception based on looking at various examples in different parts of the world is, if we invest in rural market infrastructure and overall transport systems and cold storage and temperature control transport systems and uh, price signals that come from markets to farmers, then we will see a very positive response from the supply side for fresh products, fresh vegetables, fruit, livestock products, etc. 
and, and also reducing the transactions cost for small farmers to connect into the market because small farm transactions cost around um, food safety issues, quality standards, et cetera, are very, very high. So how do you get those transactions costs down for small farms to be able to participate in these markets? If we can do all of this, then the response I think would be very, very strong. So the problem in Latin America, my hypothesis would be it's not a technology problem but much more a policy and institutional problem. But Miguel knows more about this than I do. Muchas gracias, Dr. Pingali, Dr. Bustos, por compartir este tan importante espacio para con, conversar sobre estas tendencias tan importantes que son, impo, son relevantes para, para Funtagro y su plan eh, de mediano plazo en los próximos cinco años. Así, para cerrar, invito entonces al Dr. Bustos a dar unas palabras de cierre y agradecerles a todos los participantes. Muchas gracias. Eh, la verdad es que nuevamente muchas gracias a doctor Pingali por su exposición. Muchas gracias a Miguel por tu moderación de, de, del evento y a todos los eh, miembros de la Secretaría de Fontagro que ayudaron a organizar este seminario y por supuesto a todos los participantes que escucharon esta charla a través, eh, ¿no es cierto?, de, 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 de los medios digitales. Este ha sido un, un espacio de intercambio y reflexión muy interesante y también, debo decir, eh, muy oportuno, porque nos va a enriquecer, eh, ya que coincide con el momento en que en un, en un tiempo más vamos a a estar elaborando nuestro plan de mediano plazo en Fontagro para el año 2020-2025. Y que apunta justamente a incrementar la resiliencia, la sostenibilidad de los campos y territorios, así como también fortalecer la seguridad alimentaria, la nutrición, la salud de la población, etc. Así que yo quisiera agradecer a todos eh, los participantes, especialmente a los expositores, y muchas gracias y ojalá tengamos una eh, oportunidad pronta para juntarnos nuevamente. También hacerle una, un, un, un agradecimiento a las personas que hicieron preguntas y que no pudimos contestarlas todas porque no teníamos tiempo. Muy interesante la pregunta que hizo Rubén, realmente muy atingente. Así que estamos muy contentos y muchas gracias nuevamente a todos los participantes.